Hi everyone, thank you very much for tuning in uh, for this very important presentation. I wanna take just a quick second to introduce myself and introduce the um, purpose of this presentation. My name is Stacy Schneider. I am an associate professor of history here at the college. I've been here as a full-time faculty member for about nine years. Um, I teach both American and African-American history for us. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the historical research that we're go I'm going to present to you today. All of this is a uh, result of the VCCS State Board's decision on July 21st, 2020. Uh, the State Board essentially recognizes and echoes Chancellor Glenn Dubois' recommendation to review college and facility names that may demonstrate systematic racism and do not uphold the VCCS's dedication to the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, our interim president, uh, Dr. Gregory Desinke, formed a task force to examine all of our institution names, including all of the facilities, and in fact, the name of the college itself. Um, this presentation that I'll give you today is a result of the, the uh, task force's, the task Forces efforts. Um, the historical research here will help inform our review process and we hope give the entire community, uh, students, faculty, staff, administrators, and alumni, and our entire service area accurate information about the namesakes, the rationale that's used by our previous college boards when they selected these names, and I'll provide some important questions to consider as we engage in further conversations together about this critical topic. Now, very, very briefly, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the methodology uh, used in this research uh, for the project. Thomas Nelson Jr., for whom the college is named, uh, and five of, of his uh, contemporaries of the Revolutionary Era, for whom campus buildings are named, uh, hold local significance here, right? York County and Yorktown, they're certainly kind of well known there. Um, however, <laughs> there are very few academic studies of these historical figures, and the few that are available tend to focus on their public revolutionary activities, and they kind of neglect the other side, right? And this is very common of uh, kind of these lionized figures from the colonial and revolutionary era, right? We know now in hindsight, we know that they are slave owners, slave traders. Um, there are some things that we look back and it seems kind of questionable, right? And it's one thing to acknowledge that and that will always be a part of the history. But one of the things that we have to decide on the task force is, is that worth celebrating, right? You can still be a part of history and it doesn't mean you have to have your name on the on the campus building. Um, so that's really what we're gonna look at here today. So we are gonna attempt to see both sides. That really is kind of the methodology that I used. I wanna show both sides. So we're gonna show kind of the good parts of what these um, men did and we'll show kind of the other side, the more a more fuller, a more full picture. One of the things I wanna kind of put out at the outset, right? People get really kind of fearful about this topic, about renaming um, possibly the college and maybe facilities. So everybody just take a deep breath. And I wanted to show really quickly that institutional change is inevitable, right? We're gonna be thoughtful about this. We're gonna be inclusive. We're gonna think about kind of uh, every angle when it comes to these issues, but institutional change is inevitable. It's happened before, it will happen again, hopefully, right? So I, I couldn't help it when I was digging through the archives in, in the Thomas Nelson Library, and I stumbled across a couple of these pictures. Um, and they just kind of spoke to me, I think, about change at the college. Um, Thomas Nelson Library, this is a picture here on the on the top of the library in the 1980s, right? And so I don't know if you can tell, I don't know if you remember, some of you are so young, maybe you don't remember, um, but card catalogs. When is the last time you walked into the Thomas Nelson Library or, or any library for that matter and you used a card catalog? It's probably been a while, right? And that's simply because we have a better way of doing it, a more efficient way of doing it now. It's computerized, right? You can use a search engine and you can find what you need. So that is huge. These huge, enormous wooden cabinets with all those little cards are now gone. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Uh, in 1968, if you look at the picture on the uh, bottom right, in fact, Thomas Nelson students are not called gators. We know today that that's our, our mascot is the gator, but they actually adopt the name Stomp, uh, Swamp Stompers. They're Swamp Stompers in 1968. And if you see that little caricature, 
maybe upgrading that with a gator was a good idea too. I'll leave that to you to decide. Um, in 1982, look at this faculty member. She actually entered a contest and she won this state-of-the-art computer. It's valued at $14,000 in 1982. That thing is enormous. It probably took up most of her desk and the smartphone that's probably laying next to you right now while you're watching this, uh, or maybe you're viewing it from your smartphone, uh, is probably more powerful than that computer. So I just wanna take a minute to say, look, change happens. And sometimes it's a good thing to take a deep breath and reflect on where we were and where we're going. So how does the college get its name? Well, in 1966, the Daily Press reports that the peninsula will receive a community college. Now, this is part of the movement across Virginia. And remember, the intent here is to place a community college which within 30 minutes of driving distance for uh, all Virginia residents. So this will be part of that movement. Two names are in early contention for the new institution. George With Community College is being considered, as is Peninsula Community College. By the opening of the college, though, in 1968, the name Thomas Nelson Community College is selected um, by the college board and is put forth and approved by the VCCS. And that's actually the correct policy. Uh, the college board can suggest a name, and then the VCCS ultimately uh, approves the college name. So you might be wondering at this point, what happened to George with Community College? What happened to Peninsula Community College, right? Those are the ones that were actually on the table. Well, it turns out that a scholarship from the Thomas Nelson Society and the Sons and Daughters of the American Revolution are going to secure the name Thomas Nelson Community College. Uh, the board is going to unanimously approve the new name. And here's what they really hoped to celebrate in 1968. Um, Thomas Nelson is a leading businessman in Yorktown. He is for sure one of the most historically significant um, figures to come out of the peninsula. He's a member of the House of Burgesses. He's a very early patriot. He's gonna participate in Virginia's Tea Party. And you might be saying, Virginia's Tea Party? I'm sure what you know about is the Boston Tea Party, but we actually have one in Virginia. Uh, Thomas Nelson is a guy who is so committed to these revolutionary principles that it's one of his good friends that owns this trading vessel, this, this ship, uh, and it is loaded down with tea. And they are threatening to bring all this tea ashore, right? But there's currently a boycott on tea. So Thomas Nelson and some other like-minded men um, storm the boat, break open the crates, and they're going to throw it into the river. So he is um, committed to the cause here. He is going to use his own money. He raises funds for the revolutionary cause. He is an amazing fundraiser and millions of dollars in today's money would have been raised for the cause. Uh, he's also gonna be, of course, a signer of the Declaration uh, of Independence. He's the general of the Virginia militia during the Revolutionary War. He possibly lent funds uh, to the Commonwealth of Virginia to prosecute the war. I'll tell you that after his death, uh, his family, his descendants try to recover some of that money and basically Virginia tells them to take a hike and Virginia says, look, you don't really have receipts. We have no idea if that's how much he, he lent us. So they don't really ever recover that money. Um, and of course, he's going to serve as the wartime governor of Virginia. So that's quite a long list. And you can see why if you're looking for a college name in the late 1960s, if this is all you're considering, it's not a bad choice, right? start here. I actually consider these to be the easiest names to consider first. Now the task force is charged with reviewing all of the names, right? The college name, facilities, buildings, all of those names. So let's tackle these first and then we'll go on to the more challenging names. Uh, we have obviously have the Mary T. Christian Auditorium dedicated in 2003, named after Dr. Mary T. Christian, uh, who has a huge list of, of accolades here, right? She's an educator, state delegate. Um, she's a dean of the School of Education at Hampton University. Um, amazing. Hastings Hall. Now, Hastings was originally supposed to be Jameson Hall. It's dedicated in 1980. Jameson is actually one of those um, colonial names, and we'll talk about the, the colonial names that, that are in some of these other buildings later, but it actually has changed. So it's almost Jameson, and then it switched to Hastings Hall in 1980, just months before uh, the dedication. Uh, it's Charles and, Mary's Hast Charles and Mary Hastings that uh, found the Hastings Instrument Company in Hampton. They're good friends of the college. They give scholarships, and so we actually named that building after them. Templin Hall is our newest academic building. Um, 
it's dedicated to Dr. Robert Templin Jr. He was a college president for us and for other VCCS schools, and Thomas Nelson saw unprecedented growth in, in programs and enrollment under Dr. Templin. And then finally, you've got the Espada Room dedicated in 1999. So we have a renovated conference room. Uh, it's actually, it was intended to be named after alumna uh, Carmen Hart. She's donated scholarships throughout the 1990s. So we actually went to her with the offer of naming the room after her. And she actually instead chooses to honor her parents, Angel and Rosa Espada. Okay, so those are the easier building names, the ones that aren't really in dispute. Let's jump in to the ones that are a little more challenging. Uh, we know that Thomas Nelson Community College receives its name in 1968, obviously named after Thomas Nelson Jr. of Yorktown. Um, we'll dig a little bit more deeply into him in just a second. 1974 is going to be a big year in the naming of uh, facilities, though. The College Board is going to determine that all buildings will be named after close contemporaries of Thomas Nelson. Uh, we can find this in the TNCC College Board minutes. And in those same minutes, the College President, Dr. G. O. Cannon, is asked to bring four possible names for the buildings uh, that fit those requirements. They need to be contemporaries of Nelson. Um, so here are the buildings, here are the, the names that are proposed. Uh, we've got With Hall, obviously named after George With. Harrison Hall, named for Benjamin Harrison V, uh, Griffin Hall for Dr. Corbin Griffin, Moore Hall for Augustine Moore, and Diggs Hall for Dudley Diggs. Um, let's evaluate each one of these kind of one by one. And again, we're going to talk about kind of what were their accomplishments, and now in 2020, what aspects of their history might not have been really evaluated in 1974 as they're being chosen uh, to be honored with these building names. Okay, first up, let's talk about With Hall. With Hall is named for George With. We know that he is born in Hampton. He works in Williamsburg uh, at the College of William and Mary. Most historians are gonna consider him the nation's first law professor. He's the Attorney General of Virginia from in, uh, 1753. He's a member of the House of Burgesses, member of the Board of Visitors, a professor of law. He's elected to the Continental Congress in 1775, Speaker of the House. Uh, judge of the Chancery Court of Virginia, right? And if you remember, I told you kind of the left side of all of these columns are gonna really have their greatest hits, the, the accomplishments that all of us can kind of agree on, right? The column on the right for all of these slides is gonna show you the issues that we need to think a little more fully about. And I'll tell you that George Wythe is a complicated person, right? Like most historical figures, he's not all good or all bad. He's not. Um, he's a complicated person. He, early in his life, owned slaves. He owned slaves through most of his life. He inherits slaves from his father. He really is, of all the building namesakes, he is the most complex to kind of wrap your head around. Believe it or not, his personal belief, I know I just said that he owned slaves most of his life, but his personal belief, belief opposed slavery. And Thomas Jefferson actually writes about George Wythe and says he is unequivocal on the issue of slavery. He, he actually influences law students to consider the rights of African Americans. Now, he seems to have developed this, um, this equality, this notion of, uh, of equality and, and simple abolition later in his life. And here's one of the things we can kind of point to, right? There is a Manumission Act of 1782 that has passed. So before that, before 1782, it makes it extremely difficult to emancipate slaves. You have to go through the government, it's arduous, it's tedious, and so it just doesn't happen a lot, right? But then we have the Manumission Act of 1782. So by 1783, in 1783, he has 14 slaves uh, listed in the census in his household. We have the Manumission Act of 1782, I think that has now had time after 1783 to kind of set in. And by 1788, he only has three enslaved people living in his household. He does emancipate almost all of his slaves. Uh, before he dies, everyone will be emancipated and he will actually have brought his uh, enslaved people back and he pays them to work as servants in his house. Now, what's interesting is that might be his personal belief but he is a man who consistently respects property law. When he is ruling on cases, he almost always agrees with slave owners in cases of where, where they are considering their uh, enslaved people property, right? 
Uh, he writes endlessly about the equality of, of the Negro, and he believes in simple abolition. So there are some, you know, theories about emanci uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, graduated emancipation or partial emancipation. He actually doesn't believe in that. He wants simple abolition right here, right now. Um, he keeps former slaves on as he emancipates them. He pays them for their service. Uh, he provides education and money. And I will come back to this in just a second when we talk about possible names. But the Lydia Broadneck story, I think, is one that is fascinating. And it reveals so much about the time and about her and about this system that we created here in Virginia. But really, really quickly, Lydia Broadnax is an enslaved person working for uh, George Wythe. She is a cook. She has kind of this very um, high position for an enslaved person within the household. Um, she's enslaved. Eventually, she is emancipated. And in George Wythe's later life, she is still working as, as his cook. She's now a paid servant working as a cook. And his great nephew comes to visit. And the great nephew, um, I don't know, I guess he has some anger issues. I'm not sure. But Lydia Broadnax actually sees him the day before kind of, kind of, you know, rifling through George with papers. And she doesn't really ask. She doesn't, it's not really her place to say, but she sees, sees him kind of rifling through his desk, right? The following day, she sees him kind of playing around by the coffee pot. And then she sees a small slip of paper in his hand and she sees him take that paper and burn it in the fireplace. Well, it doesn't take long before everybody has breakfast and everybody gets sick, right? Including Lydia Broadnax. Everybody who drank that coffee got sick. Well, it turns out George Wythe and others are going to die. And it turns out that the coffee is poison. There is arsenic in the coffee, right? But Lydia Broadnax uh, recovers and she goes to the police and she tells them this story. And she says, look, I, I think it was the, the nephew. It was definitely the nephew. And the reason why the nephew poisons the coffee with arsenic, because he is left out of George Wythe's will and Lydia Broadnax and other formerly enslaved people are included in George Wythe's will, right? So he thinks if he burns that or if he, he uh, uh, gets rid of that, then, um, then he can be in the entail. So, and then the final kind of uh, injustice here is that Lydia Broadnax goes to the police. She tells her story. And even though she's very believable, she cannot testify in court against the great nephew. Why? Because she is a black woman and she can't testify against a white man. So he is never convicted of murder and in fact goes free. Lydia Broadnax uh, kind of falls into poverty at the end of her life. And we have letters that she has written to Thomas Jefferson and she essentially is just uh, begging for his assistance. And he does, he remembers her and he provides her with some monetary assistance. So an interesting story, and we can talk about kind of what that story really means uh, later in the presentation. Let's take a second and let's review Harrison Hall, named after Benjamin Harrison V. Um, actually, Benjamin Harrison V is not even from our service area. He owns plantations in Charles City County and Surrey County, so he is kind of service area adjacent, I guess you, you could say. He serves for almost 30 years in the House of Burgesses from those two counties. He is a delegate to the Continental Congress. He will be the man who presides over the final debate of the Declaration of Independence. And of course, he'll also be a signer. He serves as Virginia's fifth governor. And in 1788, he is an anti-federalist, very outspoken, and he will cast a vote in opposition to the new constitution for its lack of a bill of rights. So that's what we kind of know about Benjamin Harrison. That's his very kind of um, public face. And let's look at some of the other kind of factors that probably weren't considered in, in uh, the early 1970s. So Benjamin Harrison is going to in, uh, inherit thousands of acres of land, including Berkeley Plantation. On that plantation alone, there are about 80 to 100 enslaved people uh, upon his father's death in 1745. Now he inherits very young. His father is, is actually relatively young. He's holding a child upstairs in Berkeley Plantation when lightning strikes um, and his father dies. So he is 15 years old when he becomes master of all of that, um, of that plantation. We are gonna see multiple listings for runaway slaves in the Virginia Gazette by Benjamin Harrison V. Um, and one of the things that, you know, history kind of changes over time. 
and our interpretation of history changes. So older history. So I looked at, you know, primary sources. I looked at older histories, newer histories. And one of the things that kept coming up kind of over and over again is the older histories would claim that the Harrisons kind of respected um, slave unions, slave marriages, slave families, and that they went to these extremes to not separate them. Um, here's what I found, though. Uh, advertisements seem to kind of complicate that view. So I would hesitate to kind of put that forward as fact in any way. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that in just, just a second. Okay, so the Virginia Gazette is gonna be a huge source and it was hugely helpful um, when kind of researching this project. Primary sources, the Virginia Gazette is published in Williamsburg, Virginia. It goes through several publishers, but it is really the newspaper of record for the colony of Virginia and then the state of Virginia. And so for our purposes, you get to see advertisements kind of in two categories largely um, that pertain to this. We will see um, property and enslaved uh, person sales. And then we will see advertisements for runaway slaves. We'll, we'll see both of those and they're pretty helpful. Um, now, the one thing I kind of want to point out and I won't read all of these, but if you want to come back to this presentation, you certainly can, and you can read all of the uh, advertisements that, that I've uh, included here. I will give you a tip that S's are F's and F's are S's, right? That might help you as you go. But here are some things to really look out for. Uh, I would look out for the kind of intimate details that owners or masters have about their enslaved people, right? As much as, you know, you may have heard, oh, they're, they're property, they're not considered human beings by their, by their owners. Look at how detailed, I mean, these are people that live in kind of close proximity. This is 18th century slavery, not 19th century slavery. Like if you have in your mind 12 years a slave and overseers and cotton, right? That's, we're not there yet, right? Slavery is not static, it progresses. The time we're talking about here in the 1770s, 1780s, it's still developing, right? We are still developing this uh, race-based chattel slave system. So they are living in close contact and slave people and the master typically are in pretty close contact. And I'll read the first one, right? So here we go. Run away from the subscriber, a mulatto man named Nick, bred a millwright under Mr. Nathaniel Gordon, with whom he worked many parts of the country. He is a short, well-made fellow, about 22 years old, round-faced, and has a scar over one of his eyes. He took with him a pair of leather breeches, a blue shirt coat, and many other good clothes. It is supposed he will endeavor to pass for a free man and get into Carolina, but will probably call at Mr. David Meade's where he has a wife. Whoever delivers the said slave to me shall have five pounds if taken in the country and 10 if out of it. Benjamin Harrison, right? So I think what's interesting and what you'll see over and over in a lot of these ads is how, I mean, the physical, physical descriptions are really specific down to what they were wearing when they left, right? He knows that he's got a, um, a wife at a, at a neighboring plantation and he suspects he'll go there. He even thinks he knows that he's gonna pass as a free man. He knows kind of what his um, uh, skill set is and how he'll try to make a living and where he'll try to go. So that's pretty interesting that, you know, these are not, these two worlds are not as separate as we think, right? So that's the first thing is pay attention to that. The second thing I would say is pay attention when you read these ads, how often, look at the physical, trauma on the enslaved people, right? He's got a scar over one of his eyes. There are ads here where they have missing fingers, missing teeth, right? That doesn't just happen. Some of that could have been illness or sickness because they're not really seeing uh, a doctor, but a lot of that is really indicative of the brutality of the, the system, right? So Benjamin Harrison and Thomas Nelson and these people that we've named buildings after, you know, they've got enslaved people that are missing teeth and have scars and have one eye and are missing fingers. And I think you need to kind of ask questions about that, right? Before you put their name on a building. Okay, let's go on. Slave sale ads. So you see these a lot. Um, and this is what I was talking about when I said, you know, this kind of complicates that story that older histories 
from the 40s and 50s say, oh, no, 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 the Harrisons, they don't split up families. They respect slave families. That would be nice if they did that. But let me read you a couple of the advertisements and I'll let you kind of make a judgment about that. So this first one says to be sold on Tuesday, the 11th of this instant January at the Rocky Ridge. 55, I'm sorry, 50 fine born, Virginian born Negroes for whom 12 months credit will be allowed. The purchasers getting bond with good security, all bonds not paid in 14 days after they become uh, due to carry interest from the date, Benjamin Harrison, right? The second one uh, is from Berkeley Plantation in 1774, the eve of revolution, 10 very likely young Virginian born slaves. They will be sold at Chesterfield Courthouse on Friday, the 1st of April, I think. Um, upon credit till the 10th of January next, the purchases giving bond with security too. So basically what this is saying, if, if anyone, they're advertising this widely in the, in the newspaper, right? The classified ads come down, you can buy one of these slaves. If you are an appropriate person, he will even grant you credit to take these enslaved people off his hands and to purchase one. So uh, does that seem as discriminating as some of the former histories, uh, would allege? I, I don't think so. Uh, that seems to kind of compromise what they have said, but I'll leave that to you. Okay, Griffin Hall. This building is named after Dr. Corbin Griffin of Yorktown. Uh, he's interesting because he is a physician, right? He's a medical doctor. He serves as a physician in the American Revolution. He serves as a state senator in 1779. If you go to um, Yorktown right now, you'll see kind of a uh, recreation. Um, of kind of a medicine shop that is somewhere Corbin Griffin might have worked. Uh, there's very little evidence about Dr. Griffin, to be honest with you. Um, there's kind of indeterminate evidence of slave owning. Uh, and there are two examples here. No slaves are sold with his plantation. On this bottom advertisement, he's selling his plantation. He's actually selling his medical shop. Um, and what's interesting is that no slaves are being sold with that. No, to me, that's not a yes and it's not a no, right? It just means we don't know. Um, on the top advertisement here, this is kind of an interesting one. It's got a little odd, but it's September 19th, 1774, and it says committed to the public jail on the third instant, a Negro man named Charles who told me he had belonged to Dr. Corbin Griffin of York, which I have repeatedly notified to the doctor, but no application ha uh, having been made uh, from him for the said fellow, it is probable he has told me a falsity, right? So a slave is captured, he goes to the public jail and he says, Corbin Griffin is my master. They contact him several times and he doesn't come and pick him up. So that doesn't, that's not a necessarily a yes or a no. Um, so I'm still kind of working to corroborate that. So we don't know, it would be very unusual though um, for him not to have owned slaves during this time. Now, here's some other things about him. He is going to serve as a messenger for Dr. Lee, uh, a friend of his, and he facilitates a duel or he attempts to facilitate a duel with James Mercer on September of 1774. Um, he actually is hauled before a court and has to testify uh, about this because James Mercer never shows up. But what he does say is that uh, Corbin Griffin shows up at his house four or five, six times. Um, to arrange this duel and it, it never takes place. But anyway, uh, he also, it, this is interesting and I don't, I, I wish I could give you further information about this, but I, it wasn't published. Um, he is dismissed from his post as the chief physician in the American revolution at, in Yorktown. Um, what's interesting is we don't find out why we just find out really from a letter from, uh, former soldiers that he actually doctored to, or, at the hospital and they write to him and they say, Dr. Griffin, we know this is humiliating. We know this has uh, scarred your reputation, but we're just writing in and we're saying that when we were there, you took great care of us, right? So I don't know. I don't know if it was just something political or it was, maybe it was a huge scandal. I'm not sure. I don't know if it was a rightful or, or wrongful discharge, uh, but he is for some reason dismissed from his post, uh, but soldiers write in to kind of praise him. Anyway, he concludes his practice in 1778. Okay, Moore Hall, named after Augustine Moore of Yorktown. Uh, Augustine Moore is going to be a prominent merchant in Yorktown. He has served the Nelson family since 1746. Uh, he's a young man and he actually goes before a, uh, a court 
and he is pledged as an apprentice to the Nelson family. He becomes a partner to Thomas Nelson Jr. in 1773, largely because Thomas Nelson Jr. is not a very astute businessman. Um, the business is threatened, and he brings in Augustine Moore to kind of try to make the business solvent. Um, Augustine Moore may have given supplies to the army in 1776. He lives out his life on a York County plantation. Following his death, he is still so close to Thomas Nelson Jr., uh, Augustine Moore doesn't have any children of his own. He doesn't really have any family members. So all of his property is going to be willed to Thomas Nelson Jr. He'll take possession of all of that. Probably the most notable thing about Augustine Moore, honestly, is that Cornwallis surrenders at his Yorktown house. And Augustine Moore actually isn't there when Cornwallis surrenders, but the house is still there in Yorktown. It's been kind of reconstructed. And you can see a picture here of this is the house where Cornwallis uh, surrendered. So what else do we know now in 2020? What else do we know about Augustine Moore? Well, there is scant information on Moore. We do know that he is personally a slave owner. That's kind of without dispute. He also may have engaged, probably engaged, in the transatlantic slave trade with the Nelsons. And that's kind of a big allegation, and we'll talk a lot more about that in just a, a couple of minutes. But one of the things he does as a, an apprentice and working closely with the Nelson family since 1746 is that they are going to bring in uh, slave ships from the coast of Africa. They will be in port in Yorktown and they will sell Africans imported for the purpose of, um, of, of slavery uh, throughout Virginia. So we'll, we'll obviously unpack that a little bit in just a second. Um, he himself will actively advertise the uh, return, a reward for the return of runaway slaves. We know that he has at least two homes. He's got a house in town and he's got a plantation called the Halfway House out in the county. So he's got both of those. Okay, here are some advertisements, again, uh, from the Virginia Gazette uh, regarding Augustine Moore. Um, I'll read you this one in the middle, Yorktown, June 29th, 1775, right? This is a year before the Declaration of Independence is signed. Um, it shouldn't be lost on you that they are pursuing independence and liberty from England at the same time that he is going down to the office and placing this ad in the Virginia Gazette, right? Okay. 40 shillings reward for Jamie, a tall black fellow with a large head and face and lost part of one of his four teeth who ran away from the subscriber last night and is supposed to have got on board some vessel. All matters, all masters are forbid to carry him out. His clothing, a light colored, Cyrenaut waistcoat and such other as common for plantation slaves. Augustine Moore, 1775. Uh, I'll read you, I can read you the next one too. Um, this is June 21st, 1775. So it's, it's a rough year for him in 1775 here in June. Run away from the subscriber near Yorktown on Tuesday last, two Negro men. Uh, Jemmy, a tall, stout black fellow, about 45 years old, has a large head and face and one of his four teeth, which are large, broke near the middle. Charles, a stout, young, uh, tawny fellow, under 20 years old, has a remarkable large mouth and feet and has lost part of the third finger on his right hand. As they left their work in the field, they went off with only their shirt and trousers. Charles had a new pair of coarse rolls and Jemmy's uh, was his last year's, which were a very good rolls. Much, uh, much war, but he went to Captain John Ch uh, Chisman, where he had a wife, and from thence took with him other clothes together with his wife and a boy of 12 or 14 years old with all the luggage. I will give 20 shillings to any person who will bring either of, so here we go. So not only does he run away, but he runs away, he snatches his wife and then another child uh, to try to pursue freedom. And again, you know, that's the paradox here. It's June 21st, 1775. This is when, you know, protests would have been taking place in Virginia about um, independence and freedom from what they would have termed, which white colonists would have termed the enslavement of the colony of Virginia to Britain uh, and parliament. And at the same time, um, there's actual slavery. It's, it's not metaphorical, it's not abstract, it's actual slavery that's happening and being enforced here in, in Virginia at Berkeley Plantation. Diggs Hall, uh, we've got Dudley Diggs. 
He is from Yorktown as well. Uh, he is a practicing attorney in Yorktown. He's going to serve as the lieutenant governor of Virginia. He's a member of the Virginia Assembly in 1781. He's actually captured during the British raid on Charlottesville. They actually are not looking for him. They're looking for Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> but Jefferson kind of knows they're coming and manages to elude them in Charlottesville. But Dudley Diggs is not as lucky, and they scoop him up. Uh, Dudley Diggs will help write Virginia's first constitution. Um, Okay, let me read you a couple. Uh, he advertises for an overseer, which kind of indicates he's abs an absent owner or he has so many slaves that he needs help supervising them. Uh, there's another advertisement where it reveals that the uh, Dudley Diggs' wife uh, and another enslaved, Dudley, Dudley Diggs' wife owns a slave and that slave and another woman run off, right? So let me read you this one in the middle run away from the subscriber in Fredericksburg about the middle of October last. A mulatto wench named Sally. She is of the middle, well, I gotta put my glasses on for this one. <laughs> she is of the middle statue, uh, stature, straight and well-shaped, has a bushy head, but generally wears her hair dressed up and has lost some of her four teeth. She went off with a wench belonging to Miss Diggs and I hear they have been both in York and Williamsburg, from which last place I purchased her, of Mr. Alexander Purdue. She had on a brown damask coat and jacket, but may change her apparel as she had a variety of clothes. Whoever delivers her to me shall have five pounds reward, right? William Smith. So uh, it's not Diggs that places this ad, but he specifically mentions mentions that is with Mrs. Diggs' uh, slave that this this uh, other his slave actually runs away. So um, while there's no guarantees that Dudley Diggs is a slave owner, it seems pretty obvious, right? He wouldn't be advertising for an overseer uh, for a Yorktown plantation if he didn't have a large number of slaves. Okay, so here we are. We have gotten to uh, the Nelsons of Yorktown. This is obviously um, the biggest issue we're going to talk about today. And I really do think in this case, you almost have to go back to go forward. So I have listed here three generations of Nelsons. We've got Scotch Tom Nelson, who is going to be uh, the grandfather, William Nelson, who is Thomas Nelson's father, and then of course, Thomas Nelson Jr., who is our college namesake. Now, the historian, the history teacher in me, I'm gonna to have to give you kind of a brief background and a couple issues of historical context so you can most fully understand who Thomas Nelson Jr. was. There are some big things that happen during these three generations um, in American history. It's not just Virginia history, it's not just our college's history, it's American history. So the first thing we're gonna see is the transformation from indentured servitude to race-based slavery, right? That's the first thing. The second thing, we're gonna see the rise of tobacco culture in Virginia, particularly in Yorktown. We are gonna see uh, Scotch Tom Nelson and William Nelson engage pretty heavily in the transatlantic slave trade. And we'll talk about kind of what the impact of that is. And then finally, we're gonna see Thomas Nelson Jr. and kind of evaluate him based on the gentry society. He will be a beneficiary of this gentry society this very small percentage of elites in Virginia, and we'll see all the opportunity and privilege that that gentry society kind of affords Thomas Nelson. So we'll take all of that into account. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Let's start with uh, Scotch Tom Nelson. Scotch Tom Nelson is gonna to immigrate to uh, Virginia from England in the late 17th century. He is going to become, by the time of his death, one of the wealthiest men in Virginia, and he builds that fortune largely by shipping tobacco and by selling slaves. That's what he does. Um, throughout the 17th century, um, it really is though the practice of indentured servitude, not slavery, and indentured servitude releases uh, laborers from contracts after approximately seven years. But that system of labor is kind of waning during the 17th century, fewer and fewer um, of the English actually want to come to Virginia and be indentured slaves. And this kind of collides at the same time as an uptick in the production of tobacco. And I'll tell you that it really is 
um, kind of the perfect storm. So the source of labor goes down as far as indentured servitude, but the production of tobacco and the labor that's needed uh, it, it rises. So we are going to see the demand for the colony's labor intensive tobacco crops swell. Unfree Africans during this time are going to uh, compose the primary agricultural force in Virginia uh, for the next 200 years following this, trans, uh, this transformation from indentured servitude to um, race-based chattel slavery. Now, this tremendous demand for tobacco is uh, fueled by coastal Virginia because of the unique geography of the tidewater. So we have very deep, rich, fertile soils that are around our river terraces, particularly the York River in these early years. And they are able to kind of stumble upon and develop this very, very sweet strain of tobacco. They're gonna name it the uh, York leaf. And the York leaf, it's sweet and it's smooth to smoke, right? And so it is very, very popular. There's, there's kind of this demand for it in Europe. They can't get enough of this York, this uh, York leaf. It is so dependent, this tobacco, this strain of tobacco is so dependent on precise growing conditions that it can only be produced in about 14% of the tidewater. And it commands a price. It's so rare. It commands a price that's about five times higher than um, the average bitter strain of tobacco. Um, this expensive and highly profitable strain of tobacco allows Virginia's elite planners to invest in expensive black slaves rather than uh, cheaper but increasingly scarce white indentured servants. So we start to see this transformation. This is taking place while Scotch Tom Nelson is kind of living there. And he kind of grasps onto this opportunity when he sees this switch and starts importing and selling African slaves. Now, between 1698 and 1750, three generations of Nelson, of course, Scotch Tom, William, and Thomas, uh, are gonna create, own, and run the most profitable mercantile business in Yorktown. Uh, they are going to see Yorktown rise to become the busiest and biggest slave market in the first half of the 18th century. Approximately 50,000 enslaved Africans from approximately 163 ships are gonna be landed and sold. And I know that must be astounding to you if you're watching this presentation lo locally, you've probably been to Yorktown, right? And isn't it cute? And you know, you can walk on the river walk and you can eat crab cakes, right? It's very quaint, but in the first half of the 18th century, it is the single busiest slave port or place to import slaves in, in uh, Virginia. Um, Scotch Tom Nelson is obviously going to be kind of a, a um, he's going to be one of the, the earliest converts to selling enslaved African labor. And that really is what his wealth is based on. It's interesting that uh, by the time of the American Revolution, Slavery, black slavery has penetrated so far in Virginia society that about half of the households in York County owned slaves. By about 1750, the use of enslaved people dominates labor in the area. And if you had lived in 1750 and walked around in this area, you would have seen enslaved people working everywhere. You would have seen them in numbers that you can't find in almost any other place. You'd have seen them working uh, as domestics in houses. You would have seen them serving in taverns. You would have seen them working on ships in the docks. And of course, you would have seen them uh, in agricultural um, professions in the field. So Scotch Tom Nelson, this first generation of Virginia, becomes this wealthy planter, merchant, and, uh, and port landing trustee in the up and coming town of Yorktown. He amasses an amazing amount of wealth. Um, he becomes the biggest single lot owner, meaning he owns the mo most land in Yorktown, Virginia. When he dies, uh, he will pass this on all of his kind of wealth is entailed to William Nelson, who is his firstborn son. Now this is that system, this English system of primogeniture, where it's kind of first son takes all, right? So William Nelson is going to inherit properties, the businesses, uh, and he really has been trained to kind of take over and assume these responsibilities from his father. Um, I will tell you what's interesting, and I'll show you the advertisements in just a second, but the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, I should say, seems to lessen just a little bit under William, but he still participates. So we see the height of this 
under Scotch Tom Nelson as we see the transition from indentured servitude to slavery and he is in first and he is bringing ships over from uh, Africa and he is selling enslaved people from uh, from his his business um, we see that slightly with William Nelson but the advertisements in the Virginia Gazette seem to lessen just a little bit right Okay, so let's get to Thomas Nelson Jr. because one of the things we want to kind of talk about is how much does he participate in the uh, transatlantic slave trade? Obviously, this is going to be Thomas Nelson Jr. This is our um, our namesake, and when he when his father William dies, um, he inherits everything, right? He is going to benefit tremendously from wealth, privilege, the position of his family. Um, he really is at the top of um, of the colony's rigid social structure in the 18th century. Let me just kind of put this in context for you. Virginia, by about 1770, has a population of about 450,000 people, and approximately 5% of that population comprise the ruling gentry class, 5%. So the other 95% don't really have a say and don't really count, right? And that would be kind of the rest of us. That would be Native Americans, it would be women, it would be um, obviously African Americans, whether you're enslaved or free. Um, and of course, the bulk of that other 95% is going to be propertyless white men, right? So you have to own a certain amount of property. You have to be kind of wealthy to be in this gentry class. But uh, it's also striking to know that there are only about 21 prominent families who they, they marry together, they work together, they socialize together. And these are the families that comprise or the men that comprise this kind of upper level gentry class. Um, to prepare Thomas Nelson for his role in the gentry class, he's going to be educated in England, first at Newcomb School in Hackney, which is kind of this trendy private school. And then he'll attend Christ College at Cambridge University and he'll graduate in 1760. Um, even before he returns home to Virginia, he actually has just graduated from college and his father arranges, William arranges for him to have a seat in the House of Burgesses. So he hasn't really proved himself in any real way. He's just graduated from college and on the ship on the way back, uh, his father kind of arranges for this elected position. So he's, you know, kind of lucky here. Uh, he definitely has some, some nepotism happening and his gentry uh, position affords him these opportunities. Um, now, he marries very quickly when he comes home in 1762. He's going to marry a woman named, uh, named Lucy Grimes. She actually has sons from a previous marriage. Her first husband has died. These sons are going to inherit several large plantations. Nelson acts as a guardian to these young stepsons, and he will be the one that actually man manages their holdings. One of the ones that he will manage is going to be Carter's Grove, right here in James City County. Uh, and of course, not only does he manage the plantations, but all of the laborers that work there. So all of the, the enslaved people come under his charge. Um, and he is uh, kind of well off when he gets married to Lucy as well. When he marries, William Nelson, his father, is going to give him a large landed estate of about 20,000 acres. He inherits about 400 slaves of his own and he has about 30,000 pounds. And it really does enable him very quickly to maintain an elegant lifestyle as this country gentleman, right? He really can play, um, play the role here. Okay, one of the things I, I said I would mention is we know kind of unequivocally that Scott Chum Nelson and William Nelson engage in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, Thomas Nelson Jr., from what I found in the Virginia Gazette, not so much. And I'll show you those ads in just a second. Now, we can kind of chalk this up one of two ways, right? And we've got to kind of reason it out. The first reason, maybe Thomas Nelson Jr., maybe he's just opposed to the slave trade. Maybe he's had some kind of crisis of conscience and uh, he chooses deliberately not to participate and sell uh, imported Africans within Virginia. Could be. I doubt it, but it could be. I actually think it's probably the second of the two choices. I actually think it's the changing economy. And I think that the economy just doesn't allow for the same um, same slave trade, the same rate of slave trade in Virginia. So let me tell you a little bit about what happens and you can kind of make judgments for yourself. So 
in the era of Scotch Tom Nelson and William Nelson, remember, we see the rise of Yorktown. And we see this. They happen to be there at the time when indentured servitude starts to wane. And they need another labor source for this York leaf tobacco. And so they substitute in uh, African slavery very quickly, right? And African slavery, if you are a planter, is much more convenient because it's not you don't have the inconvenience of letting people go after six or seven or eight years, right? They're going to serve in perpetuity. So that's with the first two generations of Nelsons. Thomas Nelson Jr., when he inherits this business, he's in a little bit of trouble. He's not a very good businessman. And one of the reasons why he's not making a profit is because he's not really importing and selling a lot of uh, slaves. He's not really engaged in the transatlantic slave trade. So you're, I, it could be a crisis of confidence. I actually think it's, it's just simply a matter of the economy and the changing economy of Virginia. So what starts to happen is tobacco, even this York leaf, is a nutrient sucking crop. Whenever you have one single cash crop and you plant it over and over and over and over, it's gonna suck the nutrients from the soil, right? So you can only do that for a couple seasons and it kind of burns the soil out, right? And we're gonna see this as an example. So we'll see this in the um, 17th century or 18th century, we're gonna see this in, with tobacco in Virginia. By the time we get to the 19th century, we're gonna see with this with cotton in the American South. Right. So what happens? Well, the same thing happens in the 18th century that happens in the 19th century. You need more land. If you burn out the nutrients in the soil, you need more land. And so these folks will start to go further and further west from Yorktown. A lot of them will settle a little bit more in the interior on the banks of the James River. Right. So the James River is also a river terrace. And it turns out that this York leaf can be produced there just like it can in Yorktown. And as more and more people settle in the James River, the big ships, the big trading vessels actually will circumvent Yorktown altogether and will just navigate up the James River. So the slave trade slows even at ports on the James River. It's, it tends to slow. But the first thing is that that Yorktown is now being kind of they're scooting around Yorktown. They're not really stopping there anymore. Right. But the other reason is that the slave trade, the, the international slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade is slowing as well. And one of the reasons for that is there is natural in increase that's taking place. We are now to the point where enslaved women are having babies in Virginia. And so you don't necessarily need to import slaves from Africa because now we have enough. And, I, and I'll show you, um, so it, obviously that doesn't mean that Thomas Nelson doesn't participate in the slave trade. He certainly participates in the domestic slave trade, but he, it just lessens the transatlantic slave trade, right? And the real difference there is um, the transatlantic slave trade would have meant a whole series of events have happened that slaves have been captured, they're, they're prisoners of war, or they're sold or kidnapped um, in on the continent of Africa. They're probably ca captured in the interior. They're marched to the uh, exterior. They're crammed into slave fortress fortresses waiting for uh, ships to pull up, loaded into these terrible, cramped, hot, awful ships and then they'll endure the middle passage which is just in and of itself horrific until they can get to virginia for sale so that kind of um that process is uh, it's inhuman not the not that slavery is not but absolutely inhuman and it's an extra layer to the brutality of slaver, slavery and that's what the first two generations of nelsons are kind of uh participating in and encouraging um so anyway so thomas nelson certainly engages in the domestic slave trade that's kind of without question um but we have this natural increase this rise in natural increase and so we will not see um, the importation of, of slaves at the same rate. And, and to give you some evidence of this and just show you the, the switch in advertising, I'll show you some advertisements in just a second. Now, really pay attention because you're going to see the switch in the early days when it's Scotch Tom Nelson and William Nelson. You're going to see enslaved people advertised as Angolan or from the Ivory Coast or from West Africa. That, that is kind of those are the buzzwords, right? By the time of Thomas Nelson, uh, we're going to see them advertised as Virginian-born slaves, and that is supposed to give them a little cachet. 
So anyway, so let's go on from there. Okay, so here are the advertisements that I am talking about. These all, all four of these are not going to be in Thomas Nelson Jr.'s era. These would have been Scotch Tom and William. So the first two generations, his grandfather and father. And you'll see here just arrived from the, uh, in the York River from Africa. That's 1752, signed by William Nelson and Thomas Nelson. Um, you'll see on the second one advertisements, the ship Johnson of Liverpool, Captain Jane, James Gildart is arrived from uh, arrived at York from Angola with 490 choice young slaves. Sale of them is to begin Tuesday the 12th instant at Yorktown, right? So all of these are advertising slaves that are being imported specifically for the purpose of race-based chattel slavery.